Hello, I'm Michelle Davis of the Center for Manufacturing Research at Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Tennessee. Welcome to the Fall 2019 Golden Eagle Additively Innovative Virtual Lecture Series. This is the eighth semester that we have produced this popular and informative series. The series is hosted by TTU Center for Manufacturing Research and the iMaker Space at TTU. Additive manufacturing is a focus of both entities, and as such, this short virtual lecture series has been planned to highlight the best practices, potential problems, technological advancements, innovations, and scientific contributions in additive manufacturing with expert talks from various institutions, industries, R&D centers, and laboratories. Today, we are honored to hear from Shashi Jane, the Strategic Innovation Manager at Intel Corporation. His talk is titled, Generative Design Will Change the Future of Manufacturing. The speaker will provide his contact information for questions after the presentation is over. Thank you, and I turn the pres presentation over to Shashi. Thank you so much, Michelle, and uh, thank you in general for having me. Uh, it's a real privilege to be an uh, instructor and uh, to present to you today. So as, as she mentioned, my talk is titled, Generative Design Will Change the Future of Manufacturing. And what you'll see in here is my experience with uh, using additive manufacturing and a different take on generative design to uh, give you a glimpse into what that could look like. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a strategic innovation manager at Intel. Uh, so uh, what that means is I do pathfinding. I take Intel products, put them in places they were never meant to go and kind of see what happens. So additive manufacturing is one of those things that I was able to work with a few years back. Uh, so I'm pretty much, uh, the way to get a hold of me is I'm pretty much SK Jane to everywhere. So you can get me there on Twitter. You can, you can find me on LinkedIn uh, using the, that uh, SK Jane too. Um, I'm going to give also a shout out to my um, meetup group. Uh, I run the Portland 3D Printing Lab. There's 1,400 of us in Portland, Oregon, who talk about 3D printing and its implications. We do projects together and uh, host uh, 3D printing companies and do-it-yourselfers to talk about their projects. So um, it's exciting to see all of this unfold. So you may ask yourself, why Intel? What, is, what does Intel really do? Uh, Intel, if you've never heard, uh, makes microprocessors. In, in effect, we turn sand into microprocessors. But uh, we do so much more beyond that, uh, such as uh, we build uh, accelerators for artificial intelligence. We also work in Internet of Things and uh, making devices so much smarter. So, well, how does Intel then relate to uh, industry and manufacturing? Well, a lot of our, uh, they, they say that there's going to be billions of connected devices and that Industry 4.0 is going to be generating a lot of data. But this isn't just in the, in, in the industrial space, uh, in the factories themselves. This is going to be coming from end user products and that data can be used to make better products, to make them more performant in a, uh, in a cloud connected sense, but also in a physical sense. So, well, then how do you may ask, how does Intel relate to 3D printing? The easiest answer I can tell you is that uh, you look at uh, some 3D printers, like the big iron 3D printers actually have Intel core microprocessors in them. And those uh, microprocessors run these manufacturing processes. So the same, many, the same uh, processors that are in your laptops, powering your games, powering creative tools, and so on and so forth, are also in these machines. Some of them, your desktop printers are not gonna be uh, carrying those. So think about what you would be able to do in a machine that carries so much uh, processing horsepower. I'm gonna have you hold that thought for a minute because this talk is actually not about the microprocessor itself, but what you can do with it. My hypothesis is that the intersection of additive manufacturing or 3D printing and sensor data is going to be customization at scale. And we're gonna to get to that through this thing called generative design. 
So if you have not heard of generative design, I highly suggest you, you take a look at it. So it's really about a process that, um, uh, that builds new, uh, that optimizes for one particular area and then explores all these different permutations of a design. So like you can see on the left-hand side is a, a shoe made for New Balance whose sole is, uh, is, is designed using um, a generative technique. And it gives you complexity uh, that you otherwise would not get from a, a subtractive technique, but is perfectly uh, suitable for additive. So you get, uh, this one's probably been optimized for lightness and for strength. And that's typically what you get from generative design you're going to optimize for physics and materiality. What I'm gonna ask you to think about in this talk is, what if you could optimize for a user's lifestyle? That's something that's, that's not just a, param, you know, a param, parameter or property, that's something uh, a little bit more meta than that. And I'm gonna show you how this was done you know, in a project uh, at Intel. But first, we're gonna to have to take a, a little diversion. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, scoliosis. Uh, so, if you've never heard of it, scoliosis is an abnormal curvature of the spine, kind of uh, front to back. And uh, what that results in is, uh, or actually not front to back, but side to side. Um, what that results in is, a, you know, uh, a, 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 um, is a poor stature. Uh, it also results in uh, spinal issues and the way that they treat scoliosis if it's left untreated um, is to do a surgery that straightens the spine physically but fortunately there's a treatment uh, called bracing and this is exactly what it sounds uh, like so you build a orthotic that holds the spine uh, in place and makes make sure the scoliosis doesn't get any worse so you can see over time it's, it's actually not a new technology over time, we've gone from uh, a fully leather brace, the Stillman brace, to the Milwaukee brace, which is uh, you know, pretty contemporary for the 20th uh, century. That was uh, thermoplastics and metals that were formed by hand. And then we get to the Boston brace, which is sort of a state of the art until, um, until just recently, which is a brace that's formed, hand formed fully out of thermoplastics and with uh, Velcro or uh, Lycra bindings. About a few years ago, I was working with a company called Unique, and uh, they actually have taken 3D printing and applied it to this scoliosis brace. And you can see here that it, in, being in, it, in using 3D printing, they were able to start with a body scan and kind of grow a geometry around uh, a person's figure and bake in not only the, uh, the physical uh, compression needed to brace the spine, but they were also able to add in complexity uh, like hinges and this idea of dynamic control of being able to compress the flesh no matter if you're moving or if you're sitting. And then there's full customization in there, like we have those hinges and then if you see along the bottom, you can inscribe a logo or a name. Uh, and then there's these perforations which uh, add to the lightness, but also to the style of the brace. And what's unique about this, no pun intended, is that it changed the discussion away from stigma of wearing a brace to style. The, the girls who were affected, who are, typically it's uh, girls who are affected by scoliosis, and the onset in, uh, is right around puberty, so 12 to 14 year old, uh, 12 to 14 year old girls experience scoliosis the most, and they're asked to wear these, um, these braces. So this uh, unique is providing a brace that the girls want to wear, but there's still one other problem. The brace must be worn 12 to 18 hours a day. And I, as a parent of a teen, I can tell you asking my daughter to do anything for 12 to 18 hours a day is a difficult proposition. So when unique, oh, yeah. 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 when unique came to us, they asked us to help build something that would, uh, uh, you know, uh, would it enforce the uh, 12 to 18 hour a day. Uh, so this was uh, an adherence, uh, something for adherence. So the first thing that they uh, told us is that the way that they 
do that today is by monitoring. This is a data logger that they placed in the brace and they use temperature to simulate on and off a time in the brace. So is the brace against the skin or is it not? And uh, what would happen is the, the girls would put the brace in the sun to simulate that uh, the brace was being worn and that doesn't work. So being Intel, we said, hey, you know, we have a microprocessor for that. And so we took this module we had called Curie that had similarly temperature sensors and accelerometers and, and, and pressure sensors. And we added that to the scoliosis brace. The difference was that it had, a, it also had Bluetooth. So we were able to make a companion app and you could check uh, how much wear time was uh, that, uh, the wear, that the user uh, had actually done over the course of a day or a month or uh, uh, really it was three months between visits, uh, doctor visits. So we were able to take a, a lot of data and uh, you know, make sure that the user would adhere to it and what, it, it worked wonderfully. The, the girls treated it like an extension of uh, an app on a phone and uh, it was linked to a parent. They could see that the brace was being worn. But I'm gonna point you to those three dots on the screen. So those, those three dots are indicative of correct pressure. The, the, basically the, the pressure points that are being exerted on the body, um, those would be red if they weren't correct, but green if they, they are. That pressure sensor data was used not only to, uh, it, was, it was used by the girls to see if they, the brace was cinched down, but there's something really interesting happened. The, Designers of the brace asked us if they could have that data. And what they did was they used it to remake the brace entirely. So what you see here is that scoliosis brace, the original design, and they took that pressure sensor data and they removed all the plastic that wasn't therapeutic. And what once was a functional brace and still beautiful in its own right became a wearable work of art, like you see here. Same brace, same forces, entirely different uh, geometry. And that changes the discussion even further. So not only did the users uh, lo love wearing this brace, but they also, uh, you know, it was also so custom fit to them uh, and to their data. Uh, I will tell you that Grace is our user here. When she first put this on, uh, um, she didn't want to take it off. Uh, we actually showed this at the Obama White House at a uh, fashion show for assistive devices. And you can, you can barely see the brace here, but Grace is wearing it. It looks almost like a design on her dress. And it's changed the discussion again from uh, assistive devices just being these, uh, these things that you have to tolerate to these things that become a part of a person's style. Uh, it's been shown in all sorts of different fashion shows over the last few years. It's been an, uh, it's been an amazing project. And uh, I think uh, Unique has been serving um, hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, scoliosis sufferers. So let's shift gears a little bit. I want to tell you a little bit about what we learned and where this could go. So if you think about the process of a scoliosis brace, you could lay it out and into in, the multiple manufacturing steps. Let's first talk about uh, how you, you know, how you uh, find out that you need a brace. Usually there's a doctor's visit where um, they diagnose you. Then a second follow-up doctor's visit with an orthotist who, uh, who will build a frame or a, a essentially uh, kind, of, kind of a, uh, a test brace. And then and that, uh, They'll work on the brace, add clips, add in um, you know, straps and anything else that they, they need to. Then you come back for a test fitment with the orthotist and the, uh, and the original doctor. So three doctor visits in total. Um, there's, uh, the doctor has a very hands-on process today to, uh, to mold the brace and they actually do it by hand. With Unique, they've reduced that down from a couple of days down to three three to four hours of design time in a parametric design tool. And then 
Unix manufacturing process takes about seven steps uh, as, as I laid out today. Uh, uh, they're not using so much data, but the data conversion is, is, is still pretty, uh, t it takes a lot of time and uh, a lot of specialty knowledge. So you can see there's a lot of friction in this process. So uh, let's think about the data for conversion for just a moment. Today we take, uh, you know, we take a user's data through sensors that are added in or enclosed or fitted into the brace. Uh, tomorrow, and we're starting to see this with Jennifer Lewis's work at Harvard and some of the work uh, that's uh, being doing, that's been done by Neri Oxman uh, with soft sensors and soft uh, 3D prints. Uh, eventually, these uh, sensors will be enclosed inside the uh, object and they'll be able to report back uh, information both to the user and to the practitioner or professional. So the key is, is what do you do with that data? Typically you get this out of, uh, out of an IoT device. So the way you read this is these are waveforms. Um, there's four waveforms represented here, uh, and this is representative of what was coming off of that scoliosis brace, um, that first version that, had the, that we put the sensor in. So we had orientation, which was that gyro sensor, am I standing up, lying down, somewhere in between, uh, and the pressure sensors, which were those uh, attached to those straps. So you look at this, and as a human, you may be able to figure out what, he's trying to, what they're trying to do, but over a long waveform, you may not understand that. So on the bottom, what, we're trying to, what the user's trying to do is lie down. They're trying to go to 90 degrees. Uh, and during that time, the pressure is really high in two of the places, in two of the sensors. So it's indicative that they're becoming very uncomfortable. So how do you turn this into knowledge? Uh, well, the answer that, uh, that we came to was machine learning. So machine learning is a type of AI, uh, artificial intelligence. And it's one in which, um, a system can automatically learn and improve from experience uh, without being programmed. So you may start with an understanding of how a scoliosis brace is supposed to operate or how it's supposed to be designed and the system itself can learn uh, from new inputs. So imagine a machine learning tool learning from that data sensor that the user, or from that IoT sensor that the user is trying to lie down but is uncomfortable for some reason. And we could then you listen or work with that uh, machine learning algorithm to predict when uh, the user may be uncomfortable in other situations and optimize for that. So why am I telling you about this? Well, it's actually been implemented and you can do some pretty cool things with it. Um, but before I show you how it's implemented, I want, you, I want you to think about where it could go. So imagine that you have a data-driven generative design process that's backed with machine learning. So you have tens or hundreds of braces taking sensor data and pushing it into the cloud where you have a machine learning algorithm. Today, uh, you know, as we mentioned, we have that, uh, that app. Today, that machine learning algorithm may motivate you in the app to, uh, to wear the brace more or to tighten your tighten the straps or to understand where you're uh where, where you're uncomfortable but tomorrow maybe that machine learning algorithm will put hints in your design tools where uh you could do an optimization where you could use a physical optimization like fea and you can you can lighten or strengthen or make a part more flexible Imagine that you have that feedback loop now uh, from you know, other third-party data sources, like your phone, for example, and what you could do with uh, that data. So if you had this system that could understand data from the brace and data about you and what you're trying to accomplish, you can make devices that are extremely customized. So uh, down in the bottom right, you might see that uh, 3D modeling tools, the Batanti Genesis API, that's actually one of these tools that's doing this today. So in, in essence, you could really design for a person's lifestyle. You can, uh, today the Genesis API is a topology 
Lipology optimizer that will take in a body scan. Uh, there's a specific flow for unique. It'll take in a body scan. It'll generate uh, a starting brace and then uh, use FEA to generate, uh, you know, lots of different designs, uh, 16 to 19 different designs uh, that the doctor can pick from. So instead of having uh, a designer uh, build one out, customized for each user, the system is doing that and that allows the doctor to focus more on the recovery and the health of the user. The kinds of tools that are being put into play are the very same tools that are being used for video game design and married to tools that, uh, machine learning tools that give you uh, access to creativity uh, or that give you the ability to augment your creativity. So those are generative design tools, um, you know, in things like, so the Patanti API is a generative design API, but Autodesk has de uh, generative design tools and uh, so do most of the other sort of, uh, major software manufacturers that we use in additive today. Now, the other ones that you want to think about is how do you, how do you use machine learning? There are algorithms called generative adversarial networks that will, um, that will take in parameters and then generate something new. And there, there's two sides of it. One is a generator, the other is a discriminator. So the generator will take a, an estimate at building a, like a picture of a cat. And then the discriminator will, um, will tell you if, the, if what's generated is actually a cat. And how do you use this? Well, imagine starting with, uh, a 3D model generated by um, a machine learning algorithm and a discriminator using what it knows about uh, an individual's data and the way the, and the individual's lifestyle to say this, gener this brace that's been generated will be good enough for this user and what they're trying to accomplish. That, that stretch right now doesn't exist, but it, we're not far from that. Although all the technology pieces are in place, maybe one of you will will do that and if you do then i'm really interested in hearing from you um think about the data that's available to us today you know for unique itself they had uh, the body scan they had integrated pressure sensors and uh imus are basically those uh integrated motion sensors but we also ha have access to medical records and sports data and sleep data and um, we can get telemetry even from uh, from these sources now, you think again about uh, what you could do with that data. We had that example where the user was getting uncomfortable. Let's look at if it was matched to the user's phone data. Uh, we could maybe match the time that the user was experiencing discomfort on the brace to a time uh, to, to the time series data coming out of their phone. And we may find that they're trying to sleep and they're uncomfortable in their bed. Then we may be able to do something about that. So think about the optimizations that we could do for, for lifestyle. We could, we could change up the topology. Um, we could you know, uh, change up the materiality to, uh, to make uh, a so hard area soft in case that you, were, uh, you need more flexibility. We can make re removable sections. We can optimize for manufacturing. We can do things like uh, design around a keloid for example, a scar or a bone spur, uh, there's the, the possibilities are limitless. So what I'm going to leave you with is that customization at scale is going to be fueled by additive, but also it's going to be supercharged by generative design and machine learning. I've uh, done this work with Unique over the last couple of years. You can check out what they're doing today with their scoliosis brace. Uh, and uh, the 3D printed fairings, but I'm also seeing generative design techniques being used everywhere. Uh, and the coolest one I will tell you was in the space industry, where I've seen a company called Additive Rocket building actual combustion chambers for rockets using generative design techniques. Whole engine and combustion chamber uh, built, with, uh, uh, built with additive, you know, with dozens of parts integrated. So if you're interested in talking about this, please do reach out. I'm thoroughly happy to take questions uh, offline and to talk all things generative in all industries. Um, wanted to give a shout out to Unique 
And if you're interested in the scoliosis brace, you can go find that there. And to Studio Batanti, uh, who provided uh, the imagery, imagery for here and uh, for the uh, presentation, and also were the providers of the that API that uh, I referenced. Uh, incidentally, uh, one of the other ways that Intel is involved is that we helped optimize that uh, the API for Studio Batanti. So what became became a initially an Internet of Things question became a, um, a an optimization uh, exercise for Intel. Uh, also, if you'd like to see more about uh, the, the scoliosis spray, so I'll, I'll make these slides available and you can take a look at these uh, these links. So once again, really appreciate you having me. And if you'd like to get a hold of me, uh, here are the two links I have for LinkedIn and for Twitter. Uh, 